officers, he dropped the rifle into an opening between several large boxes. It hid the gun from view unless someone stood over the boxes and peered down. Oswald rapidly descended the stairs until he heard the sound of footsteps running up. He ducked off at the second floor and dashed into the adjoining lunchroom. Suddenly a voice called out, and when he turned he was face to face with a policeman with a drawn revolver. Marion Baker was a motorcycle policeman riding in the motorcade about one half block behind the president's car. Baker looked up to where he thought the shots came from, the book depository, and immediately raced his cycle 200 feet and jumped off in front of the depository steps. Roy Truly rushed him to the closest elevator. Truly kept pressing the down button, but nothing happened. They sprinted to the staircase in the rear of the building. When Baker reached the second floor, he recalled, I happened to see him through this window in the door. I hollered, come here. Do you know this man? Does he work here? Baker asked Truly. When Truly said yes, Baker turned and continued upstairs. Oswald was now left in the empty lunchroom, and almost instantly he must have thought of the alibi he later used when captured, that he was eating lunch during the shooting. He was outside the depository less than three minutes after he had fired the final shot. He began walking away from the depository to find a bus. Near the corner of St. Paul and Elm, a bus pulled up. There were five other passengers. One was Mary Bledsoe, the landlady who had rented a room to him for one week and then refused to allow him to stay. Oswald got on, she recalled. He looks like a maniac. His shirt was undone. He was dirty. His face was so distorted. Traffic became heavy and the number of incoming sirens increased. A couple of minutes passed. The traffic came to a standstill. The driver in the car in front of the bus got out. The president has been shot, he said. At that announcement, Oswald stood up, asked for a transfer, and got off the bus. Two blocks away, taxi driver William Whaley was waiting for his next fare when Oswald approached. Whaley dropped him off in the 700 block of North Beckley, a walk of five minutes to his rooming house. Around 1 p.m., Erlene Roberts, the housekeeper, was trying to adjust the reception on the television after a neighbor told her the president had been shot. He come in and I said, Oh, you are in a hurry. He never said a thing. Roberts said he was walking pretty fast into his room. Though it was too warm for a jacket, he took one to hide the revolver he had tucked into the waistband of his pants. He rushed out of the house a couple of minutes later. Meanwhile, law enforcement had swarmed into Dealey Plaza. Soon, witnesses led the police to focus on the depository. By 12.45, the building was sealed, and a floor-to-floor -floor search had begun. At 1.12, Deputy Sheriff Luke Mooney squeezed between two tall stacks of boxes on the sixth floor. That is when I saw the expended shells, and the boxes that were stacked up looked to be a rest for the weapon. There was a very slight crease in the box where the rifle could have lain, at the same angle that the shots were fired from. Lieutenant Carl Day, chief of the Dallas Police Crime Scene Search Unit, photographed the three bullet shells in their original position. The three empty shells were turned over to the FBI the next day. Ballistics tests later determined they were fired from Oswald's rifle. Day dusted the boxes that comprised the sniper's nest. Day told the author of this book, There was one print that I knew was fresh and important the moment it came up. At the window the assassin fired from, there were two stacked boxes, and that is apparently what he aimed from. A little behind that was a carton of books. That is where he would have sat and looked out the window. When we used metallic powder on that box, toward the top of the corner was a distinct palm print, right where it looked like he had been leaning his hand as he waited for the motorcade. Deputy Sheriff Eugene Boone and Deputy Constable Seymour Weitzman were near the northwest corner of the sixth floor when they spotted the rifle, hidden between boxes only three feet from the rear stairwell. A homemade brown paper sack was found near the sniper's nest. They thought it might be the bag used to carry the rifle. Although he did not find prints on it when he dusted it with metallic powder, the FBI later subjected it to silver nitrate and discovered Oswald's fingerprint and palm print. The police gathered the depository's employees on the first floor. The only one missing was Lee Oswald. The police were not sure whether the assassin, though, had merely used the depository or was an employee. As a result, they also continued to look around Dealey Plaza. Over an hour after the assassination, three men were found inside a railway car several blocks away. They were photographed as they were taken into custody. Later dubbed the Three Tramps, they became a mainstay of conspiracy speculation. It was suspicious the police did not take their names, and the men seemed too well-dressed to be hobos. But in February 1992, researchers discovered the Dallas police had indeed booked the three tramps on November 22, 1963. The records identified the suspects as Harold Doyle, Gus Abrams, and John Gedney. They were real tramps who were sleeping in the railroad car when the police had arrested them. While the hunt for the assassin was underway at Dealey, Oswald had left his rooming house. When Roberts last saw him, he was at a bus stop across the street. Evidently seeing no buses in sight, he walked further into Oak Cliff. Near 115, Dallas patrolman J.D. Tippett saw Oswald walking briskly east along 10th Street. 
The description of the presidential assassin had been broadcast four times within 30 minutes. Tippett, a 10-year veteran, decided to stop Oswald. He pulled his patrol car to the curb behind Oswald and called him over. Oswald turned around and walked back to the car. He leaned close toward the passenger side, exchanging some words through the open vent window. Whatever he said did not satisfy Tippett, who got out of the car and started to walk around the front toward Oswald. As Tippett reached the front left wheel, Oswald whipped out his revolver and began shooting. Tippett was killed instantly. Oswald then began running back toward Patton Avenue, emptying shells from the revolver along the way. Helen Markham, standing on a street corner only half a block away, was on her way to catch a bus when she saw Oswald murder Tippett. She had to be given smelling salts at the police station before she could enter the lineup room. There, she quickly selected Oswald. Virginia Davis and her sister-in-law, Barbara Davis, were inside their home on the corner of 10th and Patton when they heard the shots. They went to the front of the house, opened the door, and the screen to see what happened, and saw Oswald cutting across the corner of their lawn, pulling and shaking the shells from his gun. Virginia and Barbara Davis both picked Oswald that same night from a police lineup. Ten other witnesses later identified him as the shooter or saw him fleeing the scene. Oswald left other telling evidence at the scene. Dashing through a gas station, he dropped his light bathed jacket. It was retrieved by Captain W.R. Westbrook. Oswald also left behind four shells that he had emptied from his gun while escaping. These shells were matched to Oswald's revolver, which he had with him when captured just blocks away. Oswald headed west on Jefferson Avenue. Within a few minutes, police squad cars were speeding toward the site of the Tippett murder. Oswald heard the sirens and ducked into the foyer of Hardy's shoe store. Johnny Calvin Brewer, the store's manager, was listening to radio reports about JFK's death when he looked up and saw the man enter the lobby. After the police cars passed, Brewer watched Oswald walk outside, look over his shoulder toward the disappearing squad cars, and then head further west along Jefferson. Brewer decided to follow him. Just over 50 yards from the shoe store, Oswald stopped near the front of the Texas theater. Julia Postal, the ticket clerk, turned away for a moment, and he ducked inside the theater. Brewer ran to Postal and asked if the man who had just dashed into the theater had bought a ticket. At that point, Postal told Brewer, I am going to call the police. When the police entered the theater, they turned up the lights and asked Brewer if he could spot the suspect. After a scuffle in which he tried to shoot a policeman, Oswald was arrested and driven to the downtown jail. The arresting officers took him into the office of Captain Will Fritz, the chief of homicide. Ruth and Marina had been watching the local television coverage of the president's visit when an announcer broke in with the news that shots had been fired at the motorcade. Within a couple of hours, the police arrived at Ruth Payne's house. Although they did not have a warrant, she allowed them to enter. Ruth and Marina accompanied one of them into the garage. The officer asked me, did Lee Oswald have any weapons or guns, Ruth recalled? I said no, and translated the question to Marina, and she said yes, that she had seen one, and she indicated the blanket roll on the floor. The policeman picked it up. It hung limp in his hands. Marina turned to ashen. Then, of course, I already knew that it was Lee, said Marina. At the same time, at the Dallas Police Crime Lab, Lieutenant Carl Day had begun dusting the metal on the rifle. Down toward the end of the stock, there was a print partially developed, he recalls, and I could see it running back up under the stock. So I lifted the gun out of the stock. It wasn't a great print. So I took the tape and lifted that print off as best I could. That print was Oswald's right palm. Day then prepared to take pictures of the stock. But before he could finish, he was told the FBI was sending an agent to collect the rifle and to take it to FBI headquarters in Washington for further tests. Day says, I had my orders, and I didn't do anything else to it. Around 11.30, the FBI came. Agent Vince Strain, and I gave him the gun. I told Vince, here's a print right here, and I pointed to it. I didn't give him that lifted print on the tape. Day had so completely lifted the palm print that the FBI, in its November 24th examination of the rifle, did not find any evidence of it. No one knew that Oswald's print had been found on the rifle until Dallas District Attorney Henry Wade told the reporter in an evening press conference on November 24th. The FBI then examined Day's lifted print and confirmed it was Oswald. The print was important because it was the first direct physical evidence that placed the rifle in Oswald's hands. The failure of the FBI to find a print in their initial examination had led to accusations that the Dallas police must have concocted the evidence in order to close the case against Oswald. Such charges are ignorant of the chain of evidence and of how Day maintained the rifle under lock and key from the moment it was found on the sixth floor until it was turned over to the FBI. While the hunt for the assassin was underway, the president's limousine had screeched into the rear of Parkland Hospital, stopping near the emergency entrance. Everyone claims to be there first, says Dr. Pepper Jenkins, 
but the only doctor there when I arrived was Carrico, and doctors Baxter and Perry arrived shortly after me. Mrs. Kennedy was also there. The president was on the stretcher on his back. He was blue-white, had fixed, dilated eyes, slow, spasmodic breathing, and was unconscious. There was initially no pulse or heartbeat. The doctors immediately noticed a small wound in the neck, almost directly under the windpipe. Dr. Carrico placed his hands under the president's back and felt for any other major wound. He did not find any. He missed the small bullet entrance near JFK's neck. Dr. Carrico inserted a breathing tube into the president's mouth and down his throat, and an automatic respirator was hooked up to the tube. As for the large wound in the head, Dr. Jenkins believes that few initially saw it. He recalls, he had a shock of hair, and he was lying with his head back against me. People knew that he had been shot, but they didn't know where, and since there was a lot of blood, it was difficult to tell where it was coming from. Dr. Malcolm Perry started a tracheotomy, cutting into the throat and inserting a tube directly into the windpipe. Dr. Perry recalls, I put the tracheostomy right where the tracheal wound was. I had to control the airway, and if I did not put the tube at the point of entry, it would not work as well. That surgical procedure cut directly over the exit wound on the throat, and therefore, within minutes of the president's arrival, that wound was obliterated. Doctors Baxter, Peters, and McClellan inserted a tube into the chest cavity to drain away any blood and fluid. Despite their efforts, the president still showed only an erratic pulse. Dr. Perry started closed chest massage. The doctor spoke about cutting open the president's chest and massaging the heart muscle. Dr. Jenkins said to the others, I think you better look at this first, pointing toward the president's head. Dr. Kemp Clark, the only neurosurgeon in the room, put on a pair of gloves and inspected the head wound. That was the first time anyone looked at it, says Jenkins. It took Dr. Clark only a moment to decide the wound was too massive. The president's pulse had gone from 20 to 10 to 0, remembers Baxter. There was no way the president could survive, no matter what we did. A Kennedy aide went to the room where Vice President Johnson was under heavy Secret Service guard. Mr. President, he said, and by so addressing LBJ, notified him that Kennedy was dead. Governor Conley had bullet wounds in his right rear shoulder, under his right nipple, right wrist, and his left thigh. Dr. Robert Shaw, a thoracic surgeon, for nearly two hours sutured the governor's damaged lung and muscles. His wounds were life-threatening, recalled Dr. Shaw. Without prompt care, he would have died. When Connolly was moved to the operating room, he was transferred from the stretcher on which he had been brought into the hospital to an operating table. That stretcher was placed into an elevator and then moved into a hallway. Darrell Tomlinson, the hospital's senior engineer, later bumped into it, and a 6.5-millimeter bullet rolled onto the floor. Meanwhile, the president's body was placed into a casket and ready for transport back to Washington by 1.40. At 2.04, Jacqueline Kennedy, four Secret Service agents, and Brigadier General Godfrey McHugh left in an ambulance for the airport with the president's coffin. They arrived at Love Field in 10 minutes and loaded the casket onto the rear of Air Force One at 2.18. Lyndon Johnson, after conferring with Attorney General Robert Kennedy, waited for a local judge to swear him in as president. That brief and somber ceremony took place in the front of the plane at 2.37, while a blood-stained Jacqueline Kennedy looked on in shock. After the ceremony, she returned to the rear of the plane, where she stayed with the casket for the remainder of the trip. Author David Lipton claims in his book, Best Evidence, that the president's body was inside the Dallas casket when it was put aboard Air Force One at 2.18, but it was no longer inside the casket at 2.47 as the plane rolled down the runway. Lipton contends that once the body was stolen from Air Force One, a covert team of surgeons surgically altered the corpse so the autopsy physicians would determine the bullets that hit the president were fired from the direction of the book depository, sealing the case against Oswald. Yet, the casket was never unattended. There was no opportunity for JFK's body to be stolen. Air Force One touched down at 5.58 Eastern Time at Andrews Air Force Base. The security to meet the plane included FBI agents Francis O'Neill and James Siebert. When the casket arrived at the hospital, it was brought to the morgue. There, Dr. Humes and Boswell, with help from FBI agents O'Neill and Siebert, and Secret Service agents Kellerman and Greer, removed the body. Fourteen x-rays and 52 photographs were taken of the body. The Navy corpsman who started taking pictures did not have a security clearance, and O'Neill confiscated his film and exposed it. The role is still in the National Archives. The autopsy photographs and x-rays are critical because they provide proof of the president's wounds and have served as the basis for forensics panel studies. Because they support the conclusion that the president was shot by two bullets from the rear, there have been attempts to cast doubt on their authenticity. But John Stringer, who took the photographs, viewed them at the National Archives on November 1, 1966, and verified the pictures were the ones he had taken. Photo experts for the select committee concluded the photos were authentic. As for the x-rays, the tests were also absolute. The three pathologists found two wounds caused by high-velocity missiles. 
There has been considerable criticism of the autopsy team and the examination they performed on JFK. Dr. Michael Bodden says a lot of things weren't done, such as inspecting the spine, dissecting the neck organs, tracing out the bullet tracks, and inspecting the clothing. The findings of the original autopsy physicians have been studied, though, by panels of leading national forensic specialists. In 1968, a four-member medical panel appointed by Attorney General Ramsey Clark concluded the president was struck by two shots from behind and reaffirmed the original autopsy report. In 1975, the Commission on CIA Activities within the U.S. reviewed the case and also confirmed the autopsy results and the Warren Commission conclusions. In the late 1970s, the House Select Committee appointed a nine-member medical panel of experts with vast experience in gunshot wounds. The panel confirmed findings that JFK was struck only by two bullets from behind. The neck wound. The doctors were unable to figure out the path for the bullet that had entered at the rear base of the president's neck. They could find no exit for that bullet. The tracheotomy done by Dr. Perry at Parkland had obliterated the neck wound. It was not until Dr. Hume spoke with Perry over the phone the following day that he realized what had happened. Early statements by some Parkland physicians that the wound in the front of the neck was a wound of entrance led to considerable confusion. At a press conference following the announcement of the president's death, Dr. Perry said that the throat wound appeared to be an entrance wound. Says Dr. Perry, I did say it looked like an entrance wound since it was small, but I qualified it by saying that I did not know where the bullets came from. Everyone ignored my qualification. It was a small wound, slightly ragged at the edges, and could have been an exit or entrance. Was the hole in the front of the president's neck, described as only 5 millimeters to 8 millimeters in size, too small to be an exit wound, as some have charged? There is a mistaken impression that exit wounds are large, gaping wounds, says Dr. Bodden. If the bullet isn't tumbling and doesn't hit anything inside the body beyond soft tissue, they can be very small. When the House Select Committee's nine-member forensics panel reviewed the autopsy x-rays and photographs, it also examined JFK's clothing, which confirmed the direction of the neck shot. Through enhancements of the original autopsy photos, the panel also noticed that the back wound had a unique abrasion collar, a roughening of the edges, which clearly depicts the entrance, and that the hole in the neck was the exit for that bullet. The head wound. The autopsy physicians concluded the fatal shot entered the rear of the president's skull and exploded out the right side of his head. The entry on the back of the head was small, not much larger than the 6.5 millimeter bullet that did the damage. Examination of the inside of the skull indicated the edges of the hole were beveled inward, confirming the entry point. However, some of the Parkland doctors who treated the president described a gaping wound in the rear of JFK's head, the occipital region, not the right side, the parietal. If true, this not only contradicted the findings of the autopsy team, but was evidence that the president was probably shot from the front with a large exit hole in the rear of the head. Several Parkland doctors also thought they saw cerebellum, tissue from the stalk of the brain on the stretcher or in the operating room. Yet the autopsy photos of the brain show the cerebellum intact. If the Parkland descriptions of cerebellum were true, it raised legitimate questions over the authenticity of the photographs of JFK's brain, which showed no such damage. The Parkland doctors, by their own admission, did not examine the head wound in detail. When Dr. Kemp Clark looked at the wound to determine whether the president could be revived, it was the first time it had been examined. We did say there was a parietal occipital wound, recalled Dr. Carrico. We did say we saw shattered brain, cerebellum in the cortex area, and I think we were mistaken. The president was lying on his back and shoulders, and you could see the hole with scalp and brain tissue hanging back down his head, and it covered most of the occipital portion of his head. We saw a large hole on the right side of his head. I don't believe we saw any occipital bone. It was parietal bone. Dr. Jenkins' original report also stated he saw cerebellum. He says... When I read my report over, I realized there could not be any cerebellum. The autopsy photo with the rear of the head intact and a protrusion in the parietal region is the way I remember it. The Clark and Rockefeller Commission, as well as the House Select Committee's medical panel, affirmed the original autopsy conclusions about JFK's head wound. But if the president was struck in the head by a bullet fired from the rear, then why does he jerk so violently backwards on the Zapruder film? iTech Optical Systems did a computer enhancement for a CBS documentary iTech discovered that when the bullet hit JFK, he first jerked forward 2.3 inches before starting his rapid movement backwards. The backward movement is the result of two factors. First, when the bullet destroyed the president's cortex, it caused a neuromuscular spasm which sent a massive discharge of neurologic impulses from the injured brain shooting down the spine to every muscle in the body. The body then stiffens, said Dr. John Latimer. 
The muscles of the back and neck contract, lurching the body upward into the rear, likely exaggerated by the back brace the president wore. At the same instant, his body was in a neuromuscular seizure. The bullet exploded out the right side of his head. Dr. Louis Alvarez, a Nobel Prize winning physicist, focused on the jet effect. Dr. Alvarez established both through physical experiments that recreated the headshot and extensive laboratory calculations that when the brain and blood tissue exploded out of JFK's head, it carried forward more momentum than was brought in by the bullet. That caused the head to thrust backward in an opposite direction as a rocket does when its jet fuel is ejected. Two of the most controversial issues in the assassination are whether Oswald could fire three shots in the necessary time, and if the bullet, Warren Commission Exhibit 399, found on the stretcher at Parkland Hospital, could have passed through the president's back, out his neck, and then caused all of Governor Connolly's wounds. Scientific advances within the past five years allow significant enhancements of the Zapruder film, as well as scale recreations using computer animation, which were unavailable to the government panels. It is now possible to settle the question of the timing of Oswald's shots and to pinpoint the moment when both Kennedy and Connolly were struck. In 1964, the FBI's test firing of Oswald's Carcano determined that a minimum of two and a quarter to 2.3 seconds was necessary between shots to operate the bolt and re-aim. Since the first bullet was already in the rifle's chamber and ready to fire, that meant Oswald had to operate the bolt action twice. According to the Warren Commission, the fastest he could have fired all three shots was four and a half seconds. Based on its 1977 reconstruction test, the House Select Committee lowered the time between shots on the Carcano to 1.66 seconds. This reduced the time necessary for three effective shots to 3.3 seconds. The Zapruder film serves as a time clock for the assassination. The FBI concluded that Zapruder's camera operated at 18.3 frames a second. By figuring when the first and last shots took place, it is possible to know how much total time the shooter had. The third shot is the easiest to pinpoint. On the Zapruder film, the president is hit in the head at frame 313. The witnesses are almost unanimous that the headshot was the final one. Determining the time of the first shot is more difficult. The Warren Commission was unsure when the first shot was fired or if it even hit Kennedy or Connolly. Yet because the commission thought the first shot would be the most accurate, it implicitly favored the theory that the first bullet hit Kennedy in the base of the neck. It relied on several factors in determining the timing of that shot. When the president's car turned in front of the depository, the shooter had to make a fast decision because soon after the turn, the car disappeared under the foliage of a large oak tree. A reconstruction showed the president was blocked from the sniper's view from frame 167 until 210, a period of 2.3 seconds, with only a small break in the foliage at 186. On the Zapruder film, the presidential car is obscured from sight by a freeway sign from frames 200 to 224. Before the president and governor disappear behind that sign, neither shows any reaction to being struck by a bullet. However, when the president emerges from behind the road sign at frame 225, he appears to be reacting to a bullet which means he was wounded somewhere behind the sign. Since the assassin did not have a clear shot until frame 210, when Kennedy emerged from under the tree cover, the commission concluded that is the earliest he could have been shot. However, the assumption that the first shot struck the president is wrong. Ear witness testimony, in combination with the Zapruder film, suggests the first shot actually missed and was fired before the presidential car disappeared under the tree cover earlier than frame 166. Secret Service agent Glenn Bennett was in the follow-up car. On the day of the assassination, Bennett jotted notes of what he had seen five hours earlier. The first shot sounded like a firecracker, but it made him look at the president. At the moment I looked at the back of the president, I heard another firecracker noise and saw the shot hit the president about four inches down from the right shoulder. Bennett said the third shot hit the right rear high of the president's head. When he made his notes, it was not known that the president had been hit by a bullet in the rear neck. Governor Conley's recollection and actions confirm a shot was fired before frame 166. We had just made the turn when I heard what I thought was a shot, he told the Warren Commission. An enhanced version of the Zapruder film, together with the ear and eyewitness testimony, is strong evidence that Oswald fired the first shot near frame 160, shortly after the car had turned the corner onto Elm Street and before the tree blocked his view. Since the last shot to JFK's head was at frame 313, that translates to 8 to 8.4 seconds total shooting time. That is enough time for even a mediocre shooter to operate the bolt twice. After the assassination, two large bullet fragments were found in the front floorboard of the limousine and a nearly intact bullet on the Parkland stretcher. Neutron activation tests done on the whole bullet and the fragments show they represent only two bullets. What happened to that first bullet? 
The Warren Commission was close to unraveling the mystery when FBI firearms expert Robert Frazier was asked where the missing bullet could have gone. Frazier said, There may have been a shot which deflected from a limb or for some other reason and was never discovered. But the commission never studied the large oak tree that blocked the sniper's view for almost two and a half seconds. A simple examination might have revealed if a bullet had struck a limb. When was the middle shot? And was it possible for that second bullet to have caused both the president's neck wound and all the governor's wounds, the so-called single bullet theory? Enhancements of the Zapruder film show that before the president disappeared behind the sign in frame 200, he was waving to the crowd with his right hand. Even when the car and his body are obscured by the road sign, the top of his right hand can sometimes be seen waving. By frame 224, half the car is back in view. The governor is also immersed and is fully visible, but all that can be seen of the president is his right hand. It is only a few inches above the door frame. In Zapruder frame 225, the president is almost in full view and his hand is lower, with the elbow resting on the edge of the car. By 226, Kennedy started raising his arm again. At 227, the president's elbow jerked off the car. He was in full reaction to the bullet that had hit him in the rear and exited his throat. Working backwards from JFK's reaction, it is now possible to pinpoint the precise time of the second shot. The Warren Commission was not aware that the president's spine was damaged by the bullet that entered the base of his neck since the autopsy physicians did not examine the spine and did not use the x-rays in preparing their final report. The damage was first discovered by Dr. John Latimer when he examined the autopsy x-rays in 1972. The bullet passed so close to the spine that it caused blast injury, trauma near the sixth cervical vertebra, C6. A spinal injury at the level of C6 can cause a reaction called Thorburn's position, a spinal injury that forces the victim's arms to jerk up into a fixed position almost parallel with the chin, the hands gathered near the neck, and the elbows pushed out to the sides. That is exactly the position the president started assuming at frames 226 to 227. Kennedy's Thorburn response at frames 226 to 27 was between one and two-tenths of a second after the bullet hit him, which translates to 1.8 to 3.66 Zapruder frames. That means President Kennedy was first wounded at frames 223 to 224, or just before he was visible from behind the road sign. That is three and a half seconds after Oswald had fired his first shot near frame 160, more than enough time for him to cock the bolt, re-aim, and fire again. The focus now moves to Governor Connolly. When does he show evidence of being shot? Is there a long enough delay to raise the possibility that a bullet from a second gunman struck him? At frame 224, the right front of the governor's suit jacket flies up from his chest. Discovered in a 1992 computer enhancement, this jacket movement took place at the exact area where the governor's suit and shirt have a bullet hole. Since Kennedy and Connolly were less than two feet apart in the car, the bullet, with an initial muzzle velocity of more than 2,000 feet per second, passed through them almost simultaneously at frame 224. Talking of the bullet that wounded him, Connolly told the Warren Commission, well, in my judgment, it just couldn't be the first one because I heard the sound of the shot. Any rifle has a velocity that exceeds the speed of sound. Although convinced he was struck by the second bullet, he thought the president was hit by the first shot. The primary reason that Connolly believed the first bullet hit the president was the testimony of his wife, Nellie. She told the Warren Commission that when she heard the first shot, quote, I turned over my right shoulder and looked back and saw the president as he had both hands at his neck. Then very soon there was the second shot which hit John, end quote. In her testimony, there is a key sentence that the commission and subsequent researchers have overlooked. Mrs. Connolly said, quote, as the first shot was hit and I turned to look at the same time, I recalled John saying, oh, no, no, no. Then there was the second shot and it hit John, end quote. However, she could not have heard her husband say, oh, no, 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 at the first shot. He was clear in his testimony. When I was hit, I said, oh, no, no, no. What Mrs. Connolly thought was the first shot was actually the second shot, which hit both her husband and the president. The conclusive evidence is again found in the Zapruder film. The enhancement shows Mrs. Connolly turning to her right only at frames 227 to 228, a split second after the second shot. In an October 30th, 1966 interview with Life magazine, the governor said, there is my absolute knowledge, and Nellie's too, that one bullet caused the president's wound and that an entirely separate shot struck me. I'll never change my mind. The author of this book presented some of the new evidence to Governor Connolly during a telephone conversation in May 1992. He was open-minded that new technologies might provide an understanding not available in earlier years and said the new disclosures might well be the solution 
to his earlier objection. The final issue on the single bullet is whether Commission Exhibit 399, the bullet found on the stretcher at Parkland Hospital, could have inflicted the wounds to both men and remained only partially deformed. CE-399, denigrated as the magic bullet by buffs, is described as pristine in conspiracy books. CE-399 is a fully jacketed military bullet, and ballistics expert Howard Donahue described it as, quote, obviously somewhat bent and severely flattened, so much so that a small amount of lead had been extruded from the bullet's base, end quote. It's called a pristine bullet, said Dr. Michael Bodden, which is a term that is inaccurate. It's like being a little bit pregnant. This is a damaged bullet and is not pristine. In reconstructions, firing shots into a variety of items, the Warren Commission was unable to duplicate a bullet in the same condition. The commission test bullet, most often cited by critics, is CE-856, in which a bullet was fired into a cadaver's wrist to simulate Connolly's wrist wound. CE-856 emerged with a badly smashed nose. Since the bullet that did the actual wounds to both men also had to pass through the president's neck, the governor's chest, and then into his thigh, it seemed to indicate that the stretcher bullet could not be the single bullet. Nonsense, says Dr. Latimer. What that shows is that the Warren Commission did not conduct the proper experiments. They fired a 6.5-millimeter shell traveling at over 2,000 feet per second directly into a wrist bone. Of course you are going to get deformation of the bullet when it strikes a hard object at full speed. If Governor Connolly's wrist had been hit on a straight fly by that bullet, CE-399, the bullet would be in much worse shape, and so would his wrist. The final issue in the single bullet theory involves bullet fragments found in Governor Connolly. The FBI randomly weighed 6.5-millimeter Carcano bullets and determined the average weight was 161.2 grains. The stretcher bullet weighed 158.6, meaning only 2.6 grains of its mass were lost. No fragments were left in President Kennedy's neck wound. However, the governor had three removed from his wrist during surgery, and two small fragments remained in his wrist and one in his thigh. Dr. Gregory, who performed the surgery on the governor's wrist, said the fragments he removed were, quote, flakes of metal. I would estimate that they would be weighed in micrograms, which is a very small amount of weight, end quote. As for the thigh fragment, Dr. Gregory described it as microscopic. Neutron activation tests performed on the fragments removed from Governor Connolly determined they were from the single 6.5-millimeter bullet found on the stretcher at Parkland Hospital. While the activity at Parkland Hospital had been frenetic, it was also hectic back at the jail, where Oswald had been questioned at length for a total of approximately 12 hours between 2.30 p.m. on the day of the assassination, Friday, November 22nd, until just after 11 a.m. on Sunday, November 24th. The first priority in the interrogations was to discover whether Oswald had accomplices. Assistant District Attorney Bill Alexander sat in on several hours of questioning. Alexander told the author of this book, We felt pretty comfortable, soon after we started questioning him, that there was no one else involved. More than 300 reporters had camped out on the third floor of the jail. Whenever a witness appeared for a lineup or Oswald was escorted through the hallway, the journalists surged forward, shouting questions and snapping photos. Police Chief Curry decided to make Oswald available for a press conference in a small basement assembly room. Shortly after midnight, he was brought into the room, packed with 100 police and press. Immediately, they began to shoot questions at him and shove microphones into his face. Curry took Oswald from the room after a few moments. District Attorney Wade remained to answer reporters' questions. In answer to one, Wade said that Oswald belonged to the Free Cuba Committee. A few reporters corrected Wade, pointing out that early press reports said it was fair play for Cuba. One person who spoke from the back row was not a reporter, but a Dallas nightclub owner who had sneaked into the press conference. His name was Jack Ruby. Ruby was born Jacob Rubenstein into an Orthodox Jewish home, the fifth of eight children, in March 1911 in Chicago. The family was very poor and had moved four times by the time Jack was five, always in lower-class, street-tough Jewish ghettos. His father, Joseph, was a heavy drinker who beat his mother, Fanny. When Jack was ten years old, his parents separated. He frequently skipped classes to stay on the streets, and as a result, flunked the third grade. Although he later claimed to have finished the eighth grade, records show he completed only the sixth. In 1933, just before he turned 22, Ruby moved to California, hoping to make more money. By 1937, his new start in California had fizzled, and he returned to Chicago. In 1943, he was drafted into the Army Air Force. At the age of 32, he was the oldest in his unit and ran some dice and card games, as well as peddling everything from chocolates to cigarettes. Once, when a sergeant called him a Jew bastard, Ruby beat him mercilessly. Although not religious, Ruby was always extremely sensitive to anti-Semitism. But the men who served with Ruby liked him. 
He had no disciplinary trouble while in the Army, achieved the rank of Private First Class, and was honorably discharged on February 21, 1946. He returned to Chicago, but decided to follow his sister Eva to Dallas. She had gone there in 1947 and opened the Singapore Supper Club, which she ran as a nightclub. When Jack moved to Dallas by late 1947, he helped her manage the club. On December 30, 1947, he legally changed his name to Jack Leon Ruby. During the next 16 years in Dallas, he owned interest in six nightclubs, losing money in each venture until he finally managed to turn a small profit at his last one, the Carousel, a strip club. End of sight. Ruby, anxious to be accepted in Dallas, was frustrated by his repeated business failures. He would do anything to attract attention to himself, said Janet Conforto, his star dancer known as Jada. He craved attention. He hung around police headquarters. He was a nuisance around newspaper offices. He knew a tremendous number of people in Dallas, but he didn't have many friends. People who knew him knew he was a zero, recalled friend Tony Zoppi. Although his employees generally liked him and found him generous if they were in need, he had a volatile and vicious temper. He also displayed eccentric qualities that made those who knew him sometimes question his stability. Patricia Birch, who had danced for him under the stage name Penny Dollar, recalled he was a fitness fanatic who came into the girls' dressing room without a shirt, hit his chest like a gorilla, and asked if they thought he had a good build. At a party, she witnessed him take off his clothes and roll around the floor naked. Yet Ruby also could present an apparently normal and jovial side, that of a club owner ready to ensure his patrons had a good time. He went out of his way to encourage Dallas policemen to visit his clubs, giving them reduced rates and free drinks. Ruby's solicitation, though, of the Dallas police did not protect him from having legal problems. During 14 years, he was arrested nine times for charges ranging from disturbing the peace to assault to carrying concealed weapons. The Texas Liquor Control Board also frequently suspended his license for violations, primarily allowing obscene stage shows or serving liquor after hours. His legal difficulties and his associations with criminals have been the basis of much speculation that Ruby was part of the Mafia, and in particular, that his killing of Oswald was ordered by the mob to silence the president's assassin. Says Tony Zoppi, You have to be crazy to think anyone would have trusted Ruby to be part of the mob. He couldn't keep a secret for five minutes. Ruby's lack of influence and power with organized crime is apparent with the problems he had with Agva, the union responsible for the professional strippers used at his carousel club. Ruby's main competition was from the theater and colony clubs owned by two brothers, Abe and Barney Weinstein. In 1961, they had introduced amateur striptease dancing. Ruby complained to Agba that the union's constitution prohibited professional and amateur entertainers from working together, and he demanded the Weinsteins be stopped. The union took no action. Frustrated, Ruby called his brother Earl and asked for names of people who could be helpful. Ruby's long-distance telephone activity jumped significantly during the months when he tried to resolve the Agba dispute, and some of those he telephoned were people connected to organized crime. Were such calls evidence of a mafia conspiracy to kill JFK? Three of those calls, said the House Select Committee, raised the possibility that they might be of significance in the Kennedy case. However, the author's investigation reveals the calls were not mysterious. The first was to Chicago bail bondsman Erwin Weiner, who often represented mob figures. The committee feared he may have been a link for Ruby to crime bosses. Weiner later admitted that Ruby called him once about his Agva problem. However, Weiner did not offer him any assistance. The second call was to a trailer park in New Orleans, to the office of Nofia Pecora, a lieutenant to New Orleans' godfather, Carlos Marcello. This October 30th, 1963 call appeared to be a Ruby contact with a high-ranking aide to Marcello less than a month before the assassination. However, the call was not even intended for Pecora. Harold Tannenbaum, a fellow nightclub owner and friend of Ruby's, lived in that trailer park. Bercora told the select committee that he did not know Ruby, nor did he remember ever speaking to him. However, Bercora, who ran the trailer park from his one-man office, admitted he occasionally took a message for someone in the park. Apparently, that is what he did. The call to Bercora's office lasted less than one minute. Within the hour, Tannenbaum returned Ruby's call collect for 21 minutes. The third call that stumped the select committee was actually comprised of three calls, two on November 7th and one on November 8th, all to Robert Barney Baker, an aide to Teamster boss Jimmy Hoffa. The committee was concerned since Hoffa had such a well-known hatred for both John and Robert Kennedy. However, Baker and Ruby did not know each other. When the FBI contacted Baker in 1964, he told the agents that on November 7th, Ruby had telephoned, but Baker was not in and his wife had taken a number in Dallas. When Baker got home, he called the number collect. Ruby introduced himself, explained his labor union problems with his club, and sought Baker's assistance. Baker did not help 
nor did he remember the last call the following day. Where was Ruby during the assassination of President Kennedy? What did he do over the weekend of November 22nd, leading up to his deadly encounter with Oswald on Sunday? It is important to follow Ruby carefully to discover whether there is any evidence of conspiracy. Thursday, November 21st, the day before the assassination, he arrived at his club at 3 o'clock. His sister Eva was recuperating from abdominal surgery, and Ruby had to watch both clubs. He stayed at the carousel for over four hours and then drove to the Vegas club at 7.30 that evening. Ruby then returned to the carousel. From about 9.45 to 10.45, Ruby had dinner with Dallas businessman Ralph Paul. After dinner, he returned to the carousel, and shortly before midnight drove to the Bon Vivant room at the Cabana Hotel where he joined friends. Ruby left the Cabana by 12.30 a.m. and returned to the carousel to get the night's receipt. He drove to the Vegas club to collect its receipts, and by 2.30 a.m. went to his usual early morning hangout, the Lucas B&B restaurant. Between 3.30 and 4 in the morning, he drove to his apartment. His roommate, George Senator, was already asleep. On Friday, November 22nd, Ruby was up by 9.30 and at the Dallas Morning News shortly before 11 in order to place his regular weekend advertisements for his two nightclubs. Ruby went to the second floor advertising department where he met with Don Campbell. Campbell was with Ruby from 12 to 12.25 p.m., just five minutes before the president was shot. The news was five blocks from Dealey Plaza. Before 12.40, John Newman, another advertising department employee, observed Ruby sitting at the same desk where Campbell had left him. He was reading the morning news and had the paper open to a black-bordered advertisement headed in large block letters, Welcome, Mr. Kennedy, and the text accused the president of being a communist tool. It was signed by the American Fact-Finding Committee, Bernard Weissman, chairman. Ruby was disturbed that the news should have run such a demeaning advertisement and was dismayed that it was signed by a Jewish name. A few minutes after Newman saw him staring at the ad, two news employees ran into the office and announced that shots had been fired at the president's motorcade and that JFK may have been hit. Pandemonium erupted. Newman said Ruby had a look of stunned disbelief. According to Newman, Ruby left the news no later than 1.30. Seth Cantor, a respected journalist and member of the Washington Press Corps covering the president's trip to Texas, was at Parkland Hospital after the assassination. He knew Ruby and felt someone tug at his suit coat. It was Jack Ruby, said Cantor. Ruby called me by my first name and I grasped his extended hand. There were tears brimming in his eyes. Ruby commented on how terrible the moment was and asked Cantor if he should close his nightclubs because of the tragedy. Cantor said it was a good idea. Ruby later denied to the FBI and the Warren Commission that he had been at Parkland that day. Although he knew many Dallas policemen and reporters, no one saw him except Cantor. The Warren Commission believed Ruby and said Cantor was mistaken. However, the House Select Committee determined that Cantor probably was not mistaken. Ruby had reason to lie about being there. By the time he testified about it, says Assistant District Attorney Bill Alexander. He knew that whether he spent a long time in prison or not might depend on whether he shot Oswald on the spur of the moment or whether there was premeditation. After briefly stopping by Parkland, Ruby continued to the carousel. He stayed at the club for an hour. When he left the carousel at 3.15, he went straight to Eva's apartment, but stayed less than half an hour. He stopped by the Ritz Delicatessen, only two blocks from the carousel, and then went to the club. Ruby was back at Eva's by 5.30 and stayed another two hours. He apparently stopped by Dallas Police Headquarters, although he told the Warren Commission he was not there Friday night before 11.15 p.m., and it believed him. At least five witnesses who knew him reported seeing Ruby on the third floor of the headquarters sometime between 6 and 9 p.m. Ruby probably left police headquarters shortly after 8.30 and proceeded to his apartment. From his apartment, he drove to a memorial service for the president. By 10.30, he arrived at Phil's Delicatessen near his Vegas club, stocked up on kosher sandwiches and sodas, and then drove to police headquarters. When he arrived at the third floor of the station, Ruby saw several detectives he knew, and they helped him get inside. In less than half an hour, Oswald was brought out of room 317 on the way to the basement assembly room for a midnight press conference. When the conference finished, Ruby saw Dallas District Attorney Henry Wade. Hi, Henry, he yelled real loud, recalled Wade, and put his hand out to shake hands with me, and I shook hands with him. And he said, don't you know me? I'm Jack Ruby. I run the Vegas Club. And I said, what are you doing in here? He said, I know all these fellows. Ruby walked into radio station KLIF with his sandwiches and sodas by 1.45 in the morning. He talked briefly to several employees before the 2 a.m. newscast. Although it was approaching 2.30, Ruby decided to drive to the Dallas Times-Herald. On the way, he saw Harry Olson and Kay Helen Coleman near a downtown parking lot. They waved him over to their car, and he joined them. There they talked for nearly an hour. 
Harry Olson was a Dallas policeman and Kay Coleman a stripper who worked at the carousel. Ruby left them and arrived at the Dallas Times-Herald before 4 a.m. He often visited the newspaper at that early morning hour in order to check on his ads for the following day. Ruby left the Times-Herald about 4.30 a.m. and drove back to his apartment. When he got up Saturday, he drove by the carousel and then went to Seoul's Turf Bar on Commerce Street. Leaving Seoul shortly after 2.30, he went past police headquarters, where policeman D.B. Harkness saw him near a large crowd that had gathered for a scheduled transfer of Oswald at 4 p.m. Ruby drove back toward the carousel. He called KLIF radio station twice within a few minutes and spoke both times to Ken Dow, a news announcer. I understand they're moving Oswald over to the county jail, he told Dow. How would you like for me to go over there and get some news stories? Dow told Ruby they appreciated any help he could provide. He then went to Dealey Plaza, where he looked at the many memorial wreaths that had been left overnight. As he walked around the plaza, he ran into an acquaintance, Wes Weiss, a newsman from KRLD Radio. When he left Dealey, it appears Ruby once more went to the third floor of police headquarters, expecting an Oswald transfer that never took place. He then left headquarters sometime before 6 p.m., the same time Chief Curry told the press they expected to transfer Oswald at 10 a.m. the next day. Not long after that, Ruby arrived at the carousel. He left the club sometime between 7 and 7.30, heading for Eva's apartment, where he stayed for more than an hour. But by 9.30, he was back at his apartment. He drove again to his sister's apartment, then left and arrived at the Nichols garage adjacent to the carousel shortly before 11 o'clock. Inside the club, he made several brief calls. After finishing those calls at 11.48 p.m., Rudy left for the Pago Club, about 10 minutes away from the carousel. Fifteen minutes after arriving, he left again to return to his apartment. Jack telephoned Eva at 12.45 and then went to bed himself by 1.30. On Sunday, Ruby's cleaning lady called between 8.30 and 9 a.m., waking him up. He told her to call back at 2, but the call had interrupted his...